The top stories tonight in Wine News. President Rodrigo Duterte will join the first virtual United Nations General Assembly, which begins tomorrow. He will address the more than 190 state and government leaders. He is expected to include in his speech vital issues like human rights and justice and the South China Sea maritime dispute. The Department of Health the Department of Health recommends to the office of the president to set a price ceiling on COVID-19 swab tests in the country. COVID-19 swab tests range from 5,000 to 19,000 pesos. According to the DOH, this is not just adding that there are those who seem to have made a business out of COVID-19 testing. The Philippine National Police Leadership relieves the Air Mita Police Station Chief after the Manila Bay White Sand area opening this weekend. Meanwhile, the Manila Bay White Sand Beach is closed again to the public. Several jeepney drivers were found violating the protocol on one-meter physical distancing expected on public transportation designed to combat the spread of COVID-19. Those drivers were apprehended by the PNP Highway Patrol Group and given a warning. Mahirap i-tolerate yung uh, distance na nakita natin kanina, halos balikat sa balikat na. So hindi po natin hinayaan bumiya eh, upang uh, yung kalusugan naman ng mga commuters natin ay uh, ma ano, makaiwas po sa anumang sakit. New Zealand Prime Minister Hacinda Ardern removes all coronavirus restrictions except in the largest city, Auckland. And U.S. President Donald Trump and Senate President Mitch McConnell push for an immediate confirmation of a new U.S. Supreme Court justice after the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Good evening, Philippines and the world. Today is Monday, September 21, 2020. I am Harleen Delgado. Join us in the next hour as we deliver today's top stories around the country and in other parts of the world. I'm Angelo Castro III. We are also seen in 1,935 satellite monitoring centers nationwide and via live streaming worldwide through the UNTV News and Rescue social media accounts and our website, untvweb.com. I am Elsie Marcos. First in the news, President Rodrigo Duterte will join the first virtual United Nations General Assembly, which begins tomorrow. He will address the almost 200 state and government leaders. His speech is expected to include vital issues like human rights and justice and the South China Sea maritime dispute. Our Malacadang correspondent, Rosa Licoz, tells us why. Because of the pandemic, the 75th session of the United Nations General Assembly will go virtual for the first time. This occasion coincides with the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. This is also the first time President Rodrigo Duterte will participate in the UNCA, which happens from September 22 to 26, 2020. The Philippine Chief Executive is among the participating heads of states and governments of more than 190 nations around the world. According to Chief of Presidential Protocol Robert Borges, the President will deliver his speech on the high-level general debate tomorrow night in the Philippines. The President will be the 12th among the 14 speakers in the first set of speakers in the UNGA morning session. This will be the President's first time to address the UN General Assembly, the main deliberative organ of the UN where all the 193 member states are represented. The President will be able to cover several issues in his speech. This include the maritime dispute in the South China Sea as well as the issue on human rights and justice to which his controversial war on drugs campaign is related. The palace lets the people decide on how the President's address and position would be in the anticipated UN General Assembly. President Duterte will articulate principal positions of the Philippines on a wide range of issues, and I do not want to be impressed, uh, but these are the ones that he to the country, and I would uh, 
identified. That would be the global response to the coronavirus pandemic, peace and security, including terrorism and geopolitical developments in the Asia Pacific, sustainable development and climate change, the rule of law, justice and human rights, including the situation of all migrant workers and refugees, as well as peacekeeping and United Nations reforms. Rosa Nicos, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Experts are racing against time to develop a vaccine against COVID-19. In the Philippines, we may expect that a vaccine will be approved by the second quarter of next year. Our health correspondent, Aiko Miguel, details why. There is no definite date yet when a COVID-19 vaccine will be made available in the country according to the Department of Health. But the DOH agrees with the statement of Philippine Council for Health Research and Development Executive Director Dr. Jaime Montoya that the earliest possible time for a COVID-19 vaccine to be approved is by the second quarter of 2021. So yun po pong binigay ni Dr. Montoya is just a somehow uh, para bang practical at saka mas ria, uh, realistic no na timeline na baka sakali second quarter pa next year tayo talaga makapag-approve at uh, ng uh, mga bakunang ito para mailabas sa market dito sa Philippines. We need to ensure that all of these vaccines are safe and they are efficacious before we will allow it uh, to be sold or to be procured by government. Based on the timeline, Dr. Montoya stated in an interview, the possible conclusion of the Phase three clinical trials of nine vaccine candidates will be November or December this year. In January until March 2021, the Philippine Food and Drug Administration will conduct an assessment for the approved vaccine from April to June 2021, after which the agency will approve the local distribution of vaccines. The DOH explains it takes years before vaccines to combat diseases are developed. But because there is a pandemic, experts will fast-track searching for and developing a cure against COVID-19. Matagal po ang proseso. Some even takes two years no, or more bago ito mangyari. Kasi dumadaan po sa lahat ng mga phases ng clinical trial. Bago matapos ang clinical trial, uh, meron naman po tayong uh, mga regulatory process na ginagawa no, bago po natin maipalabas yan. According to the DOH, all potential vaccines should undergo clinical trial phase 3 in the country. Na ang estado ng ating mga bakuna across the globe no, na pinag-aaralan ay mga nasa phase 3 clinical trial pa lang lahat. Yung iba nag-uumpisa pa lang ng phase 3 clinical trial. And tayo, mag-uumpisa pa lang din po tayo. Nga antayin natin lahat itong magawa bago natin masiguro no, na at masabi na pwede na rin pong gamitin at mabili ng ating mga kababayan dito sa ating bansa. Based on updates from Health Department, the clinical trial of Sputnik in the country will be shortened if requirements are completed as discussed in the meeting between the Philippine government and the Russian embassy last week. Ang FDA has committed to shorten the process. So we are now looking about 43, no? 43 days. Ito na yung maximum natin. But of course, if requirements are complete, sabi nga namin sa Russian Embassy, mas mapapabilis pa to at mas mapapaikli. And we also offered to them kung pwede na tayong gumawa ng parallel. Ibig sabihin, ibigay nyo na sa amin lahat ng dokumento na kailangan namin pag-aaralan para sa Vaccine Experts Panel so that kapag nagsasubmit na sila talaga ng formal na protocol for this clinical trial, mauumpisahan na po natin ang regulatory process. Ay Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. President Rodrigo Duterte allows health professionals with complete documents as of August 31, 2020 to leave the country. Rosalie Coz tells us why. After several appeals against the deployment ban abroad of health workers, President Rodrigo Duterte has listened to them. Now he is allowing health professionals with complete transactions and documents as of August 31, 2020 to go out of the country. This was confirmed by Presidential Spokesperson Harry Roque earlier today. So you have mga papeles at documentation as of August 31, 2020. Pinayagan na po ni Presidente na makaalis para sa kanilang trabaho abroad. 
According to Labor Secretary Silvestre Bello III, around 1,500 nurses and other health professionals will benefit from the decision of the chief executive. The palace hopes no one will complain again after President Duterte granted the request of nurses who have spent already to process their papers abroad. Meanwhile, according to presidential spokesperson Roque, the government has no decision yet on total lifting of deployment ban abroad of health professionals. It was in April when the Philippine Overseas Employment Administration imposed the deployment ban due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Pinagbigyan na po yung nagkakasus na para sa mga papeles. So wala na po po pwede yung reklamo na nagkaroon sila ng gaso sa positive na nakalagay. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The Commission on Higher Education, or CHED, says it will be needing over uh, 4 billion pesos for the expansion of medical program offering in state universities and colleges in the country in preparation for the Medical Scholarship Bill or the Doctor Para Sabayan Act. The Senate passed on third and final reading last week the said measure which aims to establish a medical scholarship and return service program for poor but deserving Filipinos. The bill also mandates CHED and the Department of Health to ensure that each region shall have at least one medical school in a bid to address the scarcity of doctors in the country. In today's Senate Committee on Finance hearing on CHED's proposed 2021 national budget, CHED Chairperson Prospero de Vera told lawmakers that there are eight regions in the country with SUCs that have no Doctor of Medicine program offerings. One billion pesos will be needed for the initial operating cost of three SUCs with ongoing application, 1.17 billion pesos for the increase of carrying capacity of eight SUCs that have a Doctor of Medicine program, and 2.4 billion pesos for the 10 potential SUCs to offer medical degree. From this, over 5,000 additional medical students are seen to enroll per year. According to De Vera, included in the concerns are the lack of level 3 hospitals in some regions for the training of medical students and the hiring of medical faculty. We have to look uh, either at upgrading the hospital further in terms of bed capacity to make it bigger or targeting private hospitals that can serve as base hospitals for our SUCs. What the Commission has been doing is that SUCs who have potential, we let them sit down with the SUCs who already have good medical programs para mag benchmarking sila, magtudukan sila, magtulungan. For their part, the University of the Philippines Philippine General Hospital or UPPGH said they are willing to help and share their programs to other institutions for the expansion of medical program offering. Uh, we can actually start organizing uh, teachers as they graduate from our residency and fellowship programs and go to the provinces and uh, maybe start training them to be faculty already. Uh, so that they'll be ready uh, in the provinces that they go back to after training. Some senators also believe foreign medical students should not be allowed to study in SCUCs. The Department of Health has submitted, recommend, submitted recommendations to set a price ceiling on COVID-19 swab tests in the country. Aiko Miguel tells us why. The Department of Health has noticed and received reports that prices of COVID-19 swab testing in hospitals and laboratories vary. COVID-19 swab tests range from 5,000 pesos to 19,000 pesos. According to the DOH, this is not just, adding that there are those who seem to have made a business out of COVID-19 testing. This is why the DOH has submitted a recommendation to the Office of the President to set a price ceiling on COVID-19 swab tests through an executive order. Nakapag-submit na kami sa Office of the President ng recommendation for an executive order issuance. Dahil napansin na nga po natin itong mga uh, iba't iba, no? Differential pricing across the different laboratories in the country. And nakikita nga rin po natin yung malaking 
uh, difference no, between laboratories as to how much a swab testing cost. So, kaya nga, uh, ito po ay inaantay natin na uh, bigyan tayo ng tugon no, kung sakasakaling ito ay maaaprobahan. Under Secretary Verhera explains, there is an existing law that imposes a price ceiling on medicines, but it doesn't cover the cost of diagnostic and professional fees. So, an executive order is needed for a price ceiling to be implemented. Hindi po nakasama kasi yung for diagnostics and even professional fees. So, that is what we have tried to uh, study at ito po ang atin kung hinihiling na baka for this pandemic uh, situation that we have this time, uh, we can be able uh, to have this executive order so that we can somehow regulate the prices of swabs or the prices of testing uh, for COVID-19. The DOH will also conduct a survey to determine the price range. Under Secretary Verhere adds, they will also consult the Department of Trade and Industry and other experts regarding the price cap of COVID-19 swab tests in the country. Ay Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Baguio City will launch tomorrow its Visitors Information and Travel Assistance or Visita website and mobile application for people who wish to travel to Baguio City. But the city government will make sure to monitor the movement of visitors considering the fears of residents from neighboring towns in Benguet over the spread of COVID-19. From Ilocos Norte and Ilocos Sur, there will be limited stopovers, although there is none for those traveling from Pangasinan, La Union, and other parts of Benguet. Uh, we have two entry points that can be used, eh, which is the uh, Marcos Highway and Nagillian Road. So once they enter those roads, uh, uh, stopovers are not anymore allowed. So they go straight to our border for the first check and then they immediately proceed to the triage at the convention center. Tourists must book rooms in hotels because they are not allowed to stay with their relatives or friends living in the city. Travelers will not be allowed to visit areas outside Baguio City. We are requiring that they engage with a tour trans tour operator no, or a travel agent because uh, they will serve as our um, you know sort of a safety officers. So that means uh, our tour operators can be able to monitor you know, their movements as to the itinerary that they will create for our tourists. No? Meanwhile, the liquor ban in the city of Pines continues after Baguio City Mayor Benjamin Magalong gave such directive because of a surge in cases of coronavirus infection in local slaughterhouses caused by drinking sprees among abattoir workers. Meanwhile, the country's Department of Health says that 3,475 new cases were reported today, raising the total confirmed cases of coronavirus infection in the Philippines to more than 290,000. More than 1,500 of, of the new cases today were recorded in the National Capital Region, while Batangas, Rizal, Cavite, and Cebu all posted almost 200 additional cases each. There were close to 55,000 total active cases of coronavirus infection as of today. 86.6% of those active cases are in mild condition. We have lost 15 more patients. But through our fervent prayers, medical interventions, and sacrifices of our medical frontliners, 400 more people have won their battle against the invisible enemy. That brings the total recoveries nationwide to more than 230,000. Thanks be to God. Let's now take a closer look at the updated count of coronavirus cases around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has now reached a total of over 31 million confirmed cases in 188 countries, regions, and sovereignty. The region of the Americas has so far recorded more than 15 million confirmed COVID-19 cases, the most among World Health Organization regions. The fast-spreading disease has claimed almost 961,000 lives, while over 21.2 million patients across the globe 
have recovered from the new coronavirus infection. Thanks be to God. The Philippine National Police Leadership relieves the, Air the Ermita Police Station Chief after the Manila Bay White Sand area opening this weekend. Leia Ilagan tells us why. Ermita Police Station Chief Lieutenant Colonel Ariel Caramoan is found to have failed to strictly implement the health protocols against COVID-19 during the opening of the Manila Bay White Sand area on Saturday. This has caused his post at the Ermita Police Station. He is replaced by Lieutenant Colonel Alex Daniel. However, PNP Chief Police General Camilo Cascolan explains the police are not entirely to blame for such failure observed the measures to prevent the transmission of coronavirus 2019. Hindi lang po police ang may kasalanan dito, lahat po tayo. Di ba? Dapat matuto tayo. Sa amin pong kapulisan, sinabi nga ho namin sa iyo, we always follow the rule of law. And when we follow the rule of law, we have no choice. It's command responsibility. And I emphasize command responsibility Leia, when, uh, during my first speeches. General Cascolan adds that people in the community must also do their part, especially now that we are in the midst of a pandemic. Kailangang matuto po ang ating komunidad sa ginawa po namin. Siguro naman po, sasabihin nyo sa amin eh, mali yata yun. Pero dapat isipin nyo saan din kayo nagkamali. Dapat hindi na-relieve yung aming kapulisan kung ginawa namin ang tama. Di ho ba? Hindi ho yung pulis mag-iisip eh. Eh, konsensya nyo na yun kung guguluhin nyo kami at kami marirelieve. Chief PNP emphasizes, we can win the battle if we are united. United, we will fight as one. And your policemen will remain to be respectable, responsible, and disciplined. Leia Ilagan, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Manila City Mayor Francisco Isco Moreno Domagoso orders the temporary closure of the Manila Bay White Sand Project starting today. Dante Amento tells us why live. Yes, Dante? Harleen police personnel were not able to control the crowds that flocked to the Manila Bay White Sand Beach as it was temporarily opened. To the public on Saturday. Yesterday, more people went to see the controversial restoration project, but the distancing protocol was not strictly observed. There were even senior citizens who are highly prone to contract COVID-19 but still flocked to the area. Others were not even wearing a mask. Due to the incident, the White Sand Beach project was closed to the public today as it was ordered by Manila City Mayor Francisco Isco Moreno Dumagoso. This is also in order to continue the construction and rehabilitation efforts there. For now, Harleen, when it will be reopened is still uncertain. Mayor Dumagoso also asked the public not to go the area until the project is completed. Alam ko po, marami sa inyo nasisihan, nagagalap, sapagkat ito'y kakaibang pangyayari. Uh, yung imposible naging posible ngunit paalala ko pa rin na meron pang pandemya meron pa hong pangamba panganib sa lungsod ng Maynila With this, the Manila Police are strictly monitoring the area no picture or video taking is allowed bystanders are prohibited in the area to avoid possible flanking of people, Police Station 5 officer in charge, Police Lieutenant Colonel Alex Daniel says at least 20 policemen are deployed in the area to monitor 24 hours every day. Sa ngayon po, kinoclose po natin tong lugar kung saan may proyekto po yung sa White Sand. So, katulad ng kahapon, medyo nalabag po, isa ngayon po ay iniiwasan po natin ulit na magkaroon ng ganun, no? So, may mga ginagawa po tayong guidelines sa pagbubukas ulit na itong uh, proyekto na to para po may iaayos po natin sa mga susunod na araw kung magbubukas po. Harleen, last Saturday, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources or DENR led the cleanup drive together with some governmental agencies and the local government of Manila. The Manila Bay Rehabilitation Project has an allocated budget of more than 318 million pesos.
And that's the latest. Back to you, Harleen. Thank you so much, Dante, for that report. The relatives of missing Filipino seafarers in Japan remain hopeful their loved ones can still be found. Asher Kadapan Jr. details why. The families and relatives of the remaining 40 seafarers missing from the cargo vessel that capsized off Japan believe that there are more survivors just waiting to be rescued. According to Fredelin Adog Sanchez, sister of ship captain Dante Adog, it is possible that the missing seafarers were able to escape through lifeboats and life rafters, also still accounted for in the search and rescue operations by Japanese authorities. Kaya kami malaki ang hope namin na hanggat hindi nahahanap yung tatlong lifeboats at isang life raft ay uh, malaki ang uh, belief namin na baka they are nga floating lang somewhere and baka nga outside Japan. The group explains that the missing seafarers may have been carried by the waves to any of the uninhabited islands in the vast area where the ship sank. With about three weeks since the capsize and two typhoons that struck the area, the relatives also believe that they may have been carried off to the waters of other neighboring countries. With this, they desperately call to authorities to conduct a massive search and rescue operation and extend it to waters off South Korea. Taiwan and China. The Department of Labor and Employment has communicated with the concerned embassies for the relatives' request. The Department of Foreign Affairs also assures that Japan has been continuously conducting search and rescue operations. Since the Gulf Livestock One ship carrying about 6,000 cattle en route from New Zealand to China sank in the southern part of Japan amid Typhoon Maysak on September 2, only three Filipino survivors have already found, though one of them eventually died. They were already sent back to the Philippines, but 36 more Filipinos, two Australians, and two New Zealanders seafarers remain missing. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The government needs to allot billions of pesos to improve the country's internet connection, according to the Department of Information and Communications Technology. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. The meager increase in the country's internet speed in the past years is not enough to provide the needs of the Filipinos. And with the current pandemic, the demand for internet connection has increased even more. In the program Get It Straight with Daniel Razon, Attorney Adrian Echaus, Deputy Spokesperson of the Department of Information and Communications Technology or DICT said there is a need to invest in digital infrastructure to improve the quality, speed and coverage of the internet service. Kasi para din itong uh, kalsada, so kung may highway, meron din tayong uh, digital highway. So kung mas marami at uh, mas magandang danan, uh, syempre mas makakarating tayo uh, ng mas mabilis sa ating destinasyon. The DICD has started the Phase 1 of the National Broadband Project, or NBP, which aims to improve the internet service in the Philippines. Ed Chow said there are 2 terabits of bandwidth that will be given by a social media company for the Phase 1 of the NBP. The agency has allotted 1 billion passes for the infrastructures needed for the Phase 1. With the target completion of Phase 1 set by the end of this year or early 2021, the first to benefit the program are government offices and free Wi-Fi areas from Baler Aurora, La Union, Tarlac, Pangasinan, La Trinidad and Baguio in Binguet, Region 2, Region 3, and the National Capital Region. But the agency still needs 17 billion pesos to fund the Phase 2 of the program which will cover the rest of the country. Once the NBP is completed, the country can save around 34 billion pesos for internet connection in the next five years. Another factor that affects internet connection is the lack of towers in some parts of the country. That is why the DICD is pushing for the common tower policy that will enable independent tower companies to put up towers in different areas in the country. It Chow said this will also benefit the telcos. So mga katipid sila, uh, magkakaroon ng mas uh, malaking pagkakataon na ito nila ang budget nila sa service quality and uh, coverage improvements. A joint memorandum circular were also signed by the DICT, ARTA, and other government agencies to shorten the process of applying for permits. From the previous time frame of 200 days, now companies can finish all documents needed to put up a tower in just 16 days. Meanwhile, three bills were also filed at the House of Representatives in relation to improving the internet connection in the Philippines. 
malaki pa ang kailangan iangat ng serbisyo at hindi nangyayari no even in a, mar- a free market uh, driven uh, scenario so yung panukalang batas itinutulak na itaas yung uh, minimum service na ibibigay ng mga ISPs at ng mga telcos once filed before the committee the DICT said they are ready to support and provide assistance to push for the bills Vincent Arboleta UNTV News and Rescue we serve the people we give glory to God A coup did not happen today against the House Speakership, but the session was cut short. One of our senior correspondents, Ray Pelayo, explains why. Today's session in the House of Representatives took only around 20 minutes. There are 299 representatives who responded to the call, including those who joined the session through video conferencing. Last week, a coup against House leadership surfaced because of the alleged disparity in the budget allocations to districts. During the Department of Public Works and Highways or DPWH budget briefing with the House Committee on Appropriations on September 17, Negros Oriental Representative Arnolfo Tevez questioned the basis of allocating budget for his district which could receive only less than 2 billion pesos. Based on the information that reached the lawmaker, Taguig City would receive 8 billion pesos while Camarines Sur gets an 11 billion peso allocation. Taguig City is said to be a camp of Speaker Alan Peter Cayetano while Deputy Speaker El Rey Villopuerte serves Camarines Sur. Deputy Speaker Paolo Duterte also mentioned in a statement that some lawmakers are also dismayed over this issue. A coup against the speakership is also surfacing, but Representative Duterte clarifies that he chose to distance himself from the matter. But in an interview, Deputy Speaker Villafuerte said that Caetano and Congressman Paulo Duterte have already talked about the issue. He is also asking the lawmakers to focus on the budget deliberation. Ray Pelayo, UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. The PNP Highway Patrol Group apprehended several jeepney drivers earlier today. Some of those PUJ drivers were even ordered to unload their passengers. Joan Nano tells us why. Several jeepney drivers were found violating the protocols on one-meter physical distancing expected on public transportation designed to combat the spread of COVID-19. Those drivers were apprehended by the PNP Highway Patrol Group and given a warning. Some drivers were even ordered to unload a number of their passengers in order to comply with the one-meter physical distancing protocol. The HPG has yet to impose penalties on violating drivers. Mahirap tolerate. Yung uh, distance na nakita natin kanina, halos balikat sa balikat na. So hindi po natin hinayaan bumiyahe eh, upang uh, yung kalusugan naman ng mga commuters natin ay uh, ma- ano, makaiwas po sa anumang sakit. Last Saturday, President Duterte decided to reinstate the one-meter physical distancing rule on public transportation. However, the Department of Transportation explained that with a strict implementation of one-meter physical distancing, the previous rule of 50% maximum capacity among jeepneys and buses will no longer be applicable. The Land Transportation Franchising and Regulatory Board is expected to release new guidelines on passenger jeepneys and buses for reduced maximum capacity. The LTFRB advises drivers drivers to impose the physical distancing measures strictly even when the new guidelines are not yet available. To be on the side of caution, malalaman naman din ng uh, driver yan kung ilan. You know? uh, at uh, more or less, he, he will have a sense on uh, kung gaano kahaba yung isang metro. Pagdating dun sa loob ng sa kanyang sasakyan, alam niya, malalaman niya more or less kung ilang patsero ang kakasya. Hopefully, uh, please give us time on that one. Meanwhile, as the government reduces the allowable capacity among PUVs, several jeepney drivers are complaining over income loss. Kung ipapatubad natin yung talagang one meter distancing, according nga kay sir, uh, magiging sampu na lang po yung laman. E ano po mangyayari sa amin? Tulugan po yung unit namin, uh, yung mga tao namin, swelduhan, driver namin, nagirenta kami ng mga terminal, talo po, walang mangyayari. Para po sa akin, parang ano po yung mahirap po kasi ano po to, jeep po to, eh magkano lang po yung minimum, 9 pa rin. Eh itong jeep na to kahaba-haba po nito tapos apat lang po yung sakay ko. Wala bang gano'ng sumasakay, bawasan pa, 
Aras prodo na pong ikot namin, bawat ikot. Eh wala. Oh, baka puunin ko pa yung boundary nito. LTFRB regional directors are scheduled to meet tomorrow to come up with clear policies on the strict implementation of the one-meter physical distancing on passenger jeepneys and buses. Johan Nano, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Now, here's a glimpse of what's the weather like in parts of the country. A low-pressure area, or LPA, will affect parts of the country. State Weather Bureau Pagasa says as of 3 p.m. today, the LPA was spotted in the vicinity of Katarmang, northern Samar. According to Pagasa, this will bring cloudy skies with scattered rain showers and thunderstorms over Visayas, Albay, Sorsogon, Masbate, Romblon, and Palawan. Meanwhile, Metro Manila and the rest of the country will experience partly cloudy to cloudy skies with isolated rain showers due to localized thunderstorms. Possible flash floods or landslides may occur during severe thunderstorms. No tropical cyclone advisory is issued. The Philippine National Police arrests a man believed to be Daula Islamiyah's liaison officer in Luzon. Now, the PNP chief orders stricter monitoring on Metro Manila's borders. Our police correspondent, Lea Ilagan, tells us why. The Philippine National Police do not consider the presence of terrorist groups in Metro Manila as a threat to national security. This is after the arrest of Kevin Madrinan, alias Ibrahim Abdullah Madrinan, or Ibrahim Khalil Algaraba, in North Furview at past four in the afternoon on Saturday by the PNP Intelligence Group and the QCPD. PNP Chief Police General Camilo Cascolan reveals that Madrinan is connected to Abu Sayyaf Commander Mundi Sawadjaan, who was behind the Hulot Twin bombings on August 24, 2020. Madrinan is also believed to have links to Abu Toraife of Daula Islamia operating in central Mindanao. Maganda yan at nahuhuli natin parati at minumonitor natin ang gusto. Nakikita rin natin kung sino yung mga pinupuntahan nila at saan sila pupunta. At ang uh, isa po dyan ay uh, uh, hindi nila basta-basta magagawa yan kung walang tulong ng komunidad. Kaskolan adds, they are still investigating if Madrinan plans to perpetrate terroristic activities here in Metro Manila. The PNP chief has ordered stricter monitoring on Metro Manila's border and other places of convergence. Nakikiusap kami parat sa mga komunidad kung merong mga kahin kahinahinalang mga tao na naumiikot po sa mga lugar nyo, i-report po kaagad sa pinakamalapit na police station. The PNP also appeals to the Muslim community to report to the police any suspicious-looking individuals and packages or items they will find in their areas. Leia Ilagan, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. After almost two years, smuggled waste that came from South Korea in July 2018, which arrived at the Mindanao International Container Terminal in Misamis Oriental, has been completely returned to its country of origin. The trash weighed a total of more than seven tons and filled up to 364 containers returned in seven batches from january until this month to pyongtaek south korea according to district collector john simon this is the largest volume of smuggled waste seized by the bureau of customs The palace rejects the de facto or existing martial law in the Philippines. This was Malacanang's response after Human Rights Alliance Group Karapatan said that human rights defenders are illegally arrested over falsified charges or brutally killed under the Duterte administration. Karapatan also believes that supposed laws have been passed despite massive public opposition. According to presidential spokesperson Hari Roque, Okay, the situation then and now are very much different. Ang masasabi ko, ibang iba na po ang context ngayon. Dati-dati po, naisasara ang Kongreso, naisasara ang Supreme Court. Ngayon po, wala nang ganyang kapangyarihan ang Presidente. 
at ang deklarasyon ng Marshal na yun, pwede din questionin sa Kongreso, pwede din questionin sa hukuman. Dahil na po, natutunan tayo sa mapait na karanasan natin sa Marshal na yun, 1970. Here in New Zealand, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern removes all coronavirus restrictions except in the largest city, Auckland. On Wednesday night, Auckland will move to Alert Level 2, while the rest of the country moves to Alert Level 1 from late tonight. That will mean gatherings of up to 100 people will be permitted. Auckland's alert level will be reviewed on October 5 with any changes from October 7, Arden said. She said the virus had not spread beyond Auckland or the small number of cases in Tokoroa. She also said that Auckland needs a cautious approach. But the rest of the country could move tonight because officials were confident it had been contained to Auckland. In Auckland, face coverings will still be required on public transport and on planes to, from, or through Auckland. For the rest of New Zealand, face coverings will no longer be mandatory, but will be encouraged on planes and public transport. Arden said the virus is under control and there have been no new cases linked to the cluster for seven days. She said the three deaths were a sad reminder of how serious the virus is. Tests prove the virus hasn't spread beyond Auckland and that proved the government's approach was the right one. Arden is still urging people to get tested if they felt unwell. As well, New Zealanders should keep using the COVID Tracer app. Let's now take a closer look at the updated count of coronavirus cases in countries worst hit by the pandemic. The United States of America, as of today, has reported more than 6.8 million confirmed COVID-19 cases. Now, its death toll from the spread of coronavirus approaches over 200,000 lives today. That's more than double the number of fatalities in India, the country reporting the second and highest number of cases in the world. Meanwhile, a new survey finds that the economic impact of public health measures to prevent the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic is having a devastating effect on communities affected by conflict and displacement. The report, the report called Downward Spiral, the economic impact of COVID-19 on refugees and displaced people is based on a survey of 1,400 people affected by conflict and displacement in eight countries and more detailed surveys and needs assessment in a total of 14 countries, Afghanistan, Colombia, Iraq, Kenya, Libya, Mali, Uganda, and Venezuela. Loss of income is also affecting access to other basic services. NRC's research shows that nearly all displaced refugees and host communities have been profoundly affected economically by national lockdowns, public health measures, disruptions to trade and commerce resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, according to the survey by the Norwegian Refugee Council. NRC's survey found that nearly one-third or 30 percent of the respondents had to borrow more money than before. For the pandemic. The economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic overlaps with existing causes of food insecurity, leading massive numbers of people to become so food insecure. Moreover, the NRC research shows that the economic impacts of COVID-19 and the strain on family income make it more likely that these children will not return to school. U.S. President Donald Trump and Senate President Mitch McConnell push for an immediate confirmation of a new U.S. Supreme Court justice after the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. One of our correspondents in the USA, Sonny Coz, explains why. The death of U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg from cancer complications brought political battle in an already hyper-partisan election year. 
Just below two hours after her death, both U.S. President Donald Trump and Senate President Mitch McConnell, both Republicans expressed their desire to nominate and fill in the vacant position, with the conservative justice even many in both Democratic and Republican Party wanted to leave it vacant until after election. The nomination would solidify conservative control of the court, perhaps for decades to come. Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden in opposition said voters should decide the president who will pick the new Supreme Court justice. Two Senate Republicans have also pushed back against replacing the Supreme Court spot before November election. Hours before Ginsburg's death was announced, Alaska Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski and Maine Republican Senator Susan Collins said they will not vote on a nominee so close to an election. They cited the decision in 2016 not to move forward with a vote on Merrick Garland, who was nominated by then-President Barack Obama in March because Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell thought it should be left up to the voters in November. On November 3, the U.S. will hold its presidential election. And if an untoward legal district is to happen, the death of Ginsburg will immediately be felt in the U.S. political sphere. President Trump has already expressed several nerve-wracking possibilities on election night, like the only reason for him to lose is when he's been cheated and to expect the federal courts to confirm results on election night even when many mail-in ballots from states are still expected to arrive days after November 3 due to the pandemic. Sonicos, UN TV News and Rescue, USA. We serve the people. We give glory to God. A bombing on Solomon Islands killed Australian and British bomb specialist. Joining us tonight is one of our correspondents in Australia, Marvi Dolphin, to tell us why live. Yes, Marvi? The 40-year-old Aussie from Newcastle in New South Wales named Trent Lee was working with 57-year-old British national Stephen Luke Atkinson in a residential area of Honiara, the capital city of the Solomon Islands. In a tragic accident, the Australian chemical weapons and bomb expert, along with his British colleague, was killed in a blast in their home on the Solomon Islands, which took place around 7.30 p.m. local time on Sunday. The blast, which happened inside the two men's rented accommodation in the city, was felt more than five kilometers away. Cries for help from inside brought rescuers and emergency services to the building. Rescuers were able to reach the pair alive, but they were declared dead at the hospital. The pair were working for non-governmental organization Norwegian People's Aid, or NPA, which has 1,850 experts mapping World War bomb sites to remove and dispose of undetonated explosives in 19 countries. The Solomon Islands is known to be littered with undetonated ordnance, or UXO, from World War II. The area was a key battleground between Allied forces in Japan in the early stages of the Pacific War campaign. The organization the Kill Duo was working for is assisting the government of the Solomon Islands to develop a centralized database of all the wartime explosive remnants left in the country from seven decades ago. The NPA has suspended its decommissioning operations and other activities in the Solomon Islands while the accident is being investigated by the Royal Solomon Islands Police Force. Elsie? Marvi, that is unfortunate indeed, especially for their families and loved ones. It is a concern, though, that the pair decided to conduct explosive ordnance disposal operations within a residential area. What was the police's response on this? LC, the police confirmed that they did not know that bombs were being brought back to a residential area and that it was being transported to the apartment. The police force was not apparently involved in those operations. When the police arrived at the scene, several other unexploded bombs were found inside the apartment, according to police inspector Clifford Tunuki. He said that if the police had known, they would have requested that the items be moved Move to a safe location. The police has then declared the residence a crime scene. Elsie? Thank you, Marvi, for that report.
180 degree panoramic images can now be produced using flat lens. Jovic Burmas details why. Engineers at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the University of Massachusetts at Lowell have managed to design a wide-angle lens that is completely flat, able to produce crisp 180-degree panoramic images. Typically ultra-wide-angle fisheye lenses, which are made of multiple pieces of curved glass, are used by photographers to capture panoramic views in a single shot. Unlike these conventional spherical in shape lenses that are inherently bulky and often expensive to produce, the new fish eye lens consists of a single flat millimeter thin piece of glass. Designed after a type of metal lens, one side of the lens is covered with wafer thin material patterned with microscopic features such as rectangular or a bone shaped configuration, precisely distributing incoming light to produce panoramic images. In this scenario, light takes longer to scatter or propagate off one shape versus another, a phenomenon known as a phase delay. Although the lens was demonstrated to work using infrared, researchers say it can be modified to capture images using visible light as well. Ju Jun Hu, Associate Professor in MIT's Department of Material Science and Engineering, said this design comes as a surprise because some have thought it would be impossible to make a metal lens with an ultra-wide field view. This evolution of uniquely structured flat fish eye lenses can be potentially adapted for a range of applications, from smartphones to virtual reality glasses and wearable electronics. It can also be integrated into medical imaging devices such as as endoscopes. Jovic Burmas, UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. And those are the reasons behind the news September 21, 2020. I am Harleen Delgado. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. Sitting in for William Theo, I am Elsie Marcos, reporting live from Auckland, New Zealand. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. I'm Angelo Castro III. We serve the people, we give glory to God.